Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is January 24, 1977, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 20. Just four days ago, on January 20, 1977, our nation witnessed the crowning achievement of Rockefeller Public Relations propaganda, the so-called People's Inaugural of Jimmy Carter. Through emotional appeals to the American dream, millions of Americans are being enticed to let their hopes soar based on nothing but blind trust. But the most crushing disappointments are always those which follow the brightest hopes and the false hopes that are being raised by Jimmy Carter will come crashing to the ground all too soon. Even so, there is something to be thankful for that deserves a moment's reflection. Nelson Rockefeller still has been denied the goal he has sought for so long, seizure of the Presidency and his establishment as America's first openly visible dictator. Never before has a bright light been focused on the real plans and actions of Nelson Rockefeller and his brothers, but now, after developing a total of nine scenarios and backup plans for placing himself in the Oval Office through the back door of his 25th Amendment, he has run through them all, and for the moment he has failed. Major factors that have upset and delayed the plans of the four Rockefeller brothers for total control have included such things as the twin gold and plutonium scandal at Fort Knox, which is still being covered up, Indira Gandhi's crackdown on the CIA in the summer of 1975, and of course their double cross by the Soviet Union that began last summer with the planting of underwater nuclear missiles along our shores. And according to my own intelligence sources, the glare of the truth has played an important role in keeping Nelson Rockefeller out of the Presidency so far. In recent weeks, support for the leadership of the four Rockefeller brothers among their corporate socialist allies has been weakened by the shock of the Soviet double-cross. Nelson finally abandoned his ninth takeover scenario involving the Electoral College scheme under pressure from Brother David. Thus David Rockefeller, the most powerful of the four brothers, is now playing the role that their late Uncle Winthrop Aldridge always used to play in seeing to it that Nelson never became President. What Nelson Rockefeller may do from this point onward remains to be seen. Only one thing is for sure. Like the Soviets, he never gives up. And he has not given up on his dream of becoming the President and Dictator of the United States and ultimately of the world. But for the time being, it is his brother David who is now President by proxy through his control of Jimmy Carter. What we are witnessing in the transition from the Ford to the Carter Administration is nothing more than a changing of shifts in the one real political party that runs America, the Rockefeller Party. The Soviet Union is run decade after decade by fewer than 1% who belong to the ruling Communist Party, and the United States of America is now run decade after decade by fewer than 1% who belong to the ruling Rockefeller Party whether they call themselves Republicans, Democrats, Liberals, or Conservatives. Jimmy Carter, who campaigned as a Washington outsider, owes his come-from-nowhere election to the fact that David Rockefeller selected him some years ago as the ideal puppet for his purposes. Carter was invited to join David's Trilateral Commission and was then steeped in trilateralist thinking, in other words, the Rockefeller line. With such powerful support, Carter has no idea how dangerous a position he is now in. Already 
a Carter Watergate is brewing to cut him down. And worst of all, the threat of war hangs over everything he does. In his inaugural address Carter expressed a preoccupation with war, and for the past several weeks the American public has been under an avalanche of warnings about the Soviet military threat, including statements that the Soviets are now preparing for war. This is a complete turnabout from the virtual ban on anti-Soviet news that was in force in the controlled major media until very recently, and the excuse that has been provided for all these new warnings is a new study of intelligence information that was launched last summer as soon as it was learned that the Soviet Union was planting offensive missiles in our waters. The threat of war, my friends, is very real. But the intent of the controlled major media in relaying these warnings to you now is another matter. We are now being psychologically conditioned to accept a declaration of national emergency when the time is ripe, and to submit to the dictatorial controls it will impose. The drive to merge the United States with the Soviet Union to form an all-powerful world government has already cost us two world wars plus Korea and Vietnam. Now we are once again in a pre-war situation on the brink of Nuclear War One, and for reasons I can now reveal, the four Rockefeller brothers still believe they can succeed in bending the coming nuclear war to their own purposes. My three special topics for today are Topic No. 1. Henry Ford's parting criticism of the largest foundation in the world. Topic No. 2. The current pre-war hostilities that are leading up to Nuclear War One. And Topic No. 3. The Great Secret Race in Super Weapons. Topic No. 1. One year ago in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 8, I publicly revealed for the very first time the super-secret White House Merge Directive. Under this directive our lives in America are to be so altered that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. And since last spring I have also been drawing your attention to the little-known but central role that the major tax-free foundations have played for two generations and more to push our nation in the same direction. Last month I was able to reveal one of my sources of information about the foundations, my friend Mr. Norman Dodd, and to repeat for you his own words about the clandestine role they have played in progressively destroying the America that was created by our Founding Fathers. Mr. Dodd's story is incredible, but it is also based upon painstaking, carefully documented research which he directed for the Congress of the United States. As one of America's foremost authorities on foundations, Norman Dodd is a man whose words carry a great deal of weight. But since last April I have also been informing you that there is a contingent among the present-day trustees of these foundations who are becoming increasingly worried about the direction in which they are taking us. Even before the Soviet underwater missile crisis materialized last summer, their fears of a Soviet double-cross were mounting rapidly. And now no less than Henry Ford II has resigned in dissatisfaction as a trustee of the biggest foundation in the world, the Ford Foundation. And he has warned in a criticizing letter that a change in direction would be wise to consider. In his resignation letter of January 11, 1977, he said in part, and I quote, The Foundation exists and thrives on the fruits of our economic system. The dividends of competitive enterprise make it all possible. A significant portion of the abundance created by United States business 
enables the Foundation and like institutions to carry on their work. In effect, the Foundation is a creature of capitalism, a statement that I'm sure would be shocking to many professional staff people in the field of philanthropy. It is hard to discern recognition of this fact in anything the Foundation does. It is even more difficult to find an understanding of this in many of the institutions, particularly the universities, that are the beneficiaries of the Foundation's grant programs." Unquote. Shortly thereafter he continues, and I quote, I'm just suggesting to the trustees and the staff that the system that makes the Foundation possible very probably is worth preserving. Perhaps it's time for the trustees and staff to examine the question of our obligations to our economic system and to consider how the Foundation, as one of the system's most prominent offspring, might act more, most wisely to strengthen and improve its progenitor." Unquote. If you are not aware of the concerted drive toward collectivism that has been promoted for decades by the major foundations, these words of Henry Ford II may surprise you. Even so, you may be even more surprised at the reactions of the major foundations to his criticisms. Almost universally, their bitterest reactions had to do with Ford's defense of free competitive enterprise. For example, consider the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. In AUDIO LETTER No. 19 last month, you heard of the chilling role the Carnegie Endowment has played since 1909 in altering America's national life through warfare and twisting our education. When a high official of the Carnegie Endowment was asked for his comments on Henry Ford's letter of resignation, he reacted in the scornful words, Is that what the Ford Foundation is set up for? To promote free enterprise? Unquote. He was very upset at the mention of free enterprise, the indispensable foundation of freedom itself. Henry Ford II is not alone. Those Foundation trustees who insist upon continuing the suicidal drive toward collectivism under the long-time commitment for a one-world government are trying to put down all dissent within their ranks. But Henry Ford II has courageously shown the way, and we can hope for others to follow. Topic No. 2 In all the major wars of this century involving the United States, undeclared warfare has been a consistent pattern. In the cases of Korea and Vietnam, in fact, the entire wars were undeclared. In the cases of World Wars I and II, undeclared warfare and provocations preceded the formal outbreak of war and marked the time period in each case that has since been called pre-war. In that sense, we are now living in the pre-war days that are leading up to Nuclear War I here in America. But as we are living out the days of the pre-Nuclear War I period, undeclared hostilities have reached a level unparalleled in the past. Consider first the repeated plutonium cloud attacks which have been mounted on the United States by Soviet submarines in recent months. As I've related in previous monthly AUDIO letters, the first such attack was mounted in early October 1976 by Soviet submarines deployed along the Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf coasts of the United States. Based on the results from that first full-scale experiment on our country, Soviet Chemical Warfare Specialists concluded that subsequent plutonium cloud attacks could be mounted most efficiently from stations along the northwest coast. In late November 1976, a second experimental attack was mounted to test this out. 
and while it was not completely successful from the Soviet viewpoint, it provided all the additional data they needed. Both of these experimental plutonium cloud attacks by the Soviet Union were accompanied by convenient cover announcements by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to the effect that radioactive clouds from Chinese nuclear blasts would be passing over us. Thus an explanation was readily available should something unexpectedly severe happen, but it did not. And on December 13, 1976, as I reported last month, 21 Soviet submarines loaded with plutonium poison to inject into our atmosphere arrived on station along the northwest coast of the United States. This time, my friends, experimentation was no longer the goal. Certain individuals in the United States Government knew they were there and knew why, but did nothing whatsoever to interfere with their mission. As of December 31, 1976, 13 of the 21 subs had emptied their load into our atmosphere and headed out to sea, having timed their attack to make optimum use of severe winter storm conditions across the United States. The other eight subs remained behind to reinforce the main plutonium cloud by continuing to feed it periodically over a period of days. Finally, on January 3, 1977, these eight Soviet subs also departed out to sea, having emptied their loads into our atmosphere. According to my own intelligence sources, this third and latest plutonium cloud attack by the Soviet Union was very effective. The Soviets did achieve a very broad dispersal of the plutonium poison throughout the continental United States. This, on top of the record cold weather blanketing most of the United States lately, may well lead to an outbreak of flu-like sicknesses in the near future, to which the Government has been conditioning us now for nearly a year. Undeclared warfare by the Soviet Union is also continuing by means of the short-range underwater launch missiles which have been planted in our waters by the Soviet Union ready for use in a surprise attack. Last month I revealed that 93 such missiles were in place in American waters, and I gave the navigational coordinates for nine of them which were surrounding the island of Oahu where Pearl Harbor is located. I can now report that the United States Navy did remove all nine of these missiles, completing the operation on December 31, 1976. But four Soviet submarines were on hand to observe the complete missile removal operation by our Navy, and, of, and as of January 17, just one week ago, two new Soviet missiles were already in place threatening Pearl Harbor again. In addition, four other Soviet missiles have been planted since I recorded monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 19 last month, two in Alaskan waters, the other two on the West Coast. This brings the total back up to 90 as of now. My disclosures last month demonstrated to certain persons that I am not bluffing that the United States is indeed targeted by a massive new round of Soviet underwater nuclear missiles. But for the reasons I gave two months ago in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 18 for November 1976, I do not intend to reveal the rest of the missile locations merely to have them wasted in the deadly cat and mouse game now underway. Instead, my own intelligence sources have made it crystal clear that only public exposure of the truth about this whole deadly matter has any hope of stopping the coming war. For that reason, I have already launched efforts through a number of indirect channels which lie outside the Rockefeller sphere of control in an attempt to bring about this public exposure. If full-fledged war does come, my friends, 
America is in for a wide range of nasty military surprises. In certain areas, Soviet approaches to military technology are far different from our own, such as in the field of anti-submarine warfare. One field in which they are literally decades ahead of the United States is in the area of microwaves as they affect human beings. Since early December, the Soviet Union has been conducting a major experimental test program on a new satellite-based system that uses microwaves to directly affect the behavior of humans. The test victims, the crews of selected tankers and freighters in and near American waters. Soviet researchers discovered long ago that prolonged exposure to microwaves, even at intensities considered safe in the United States, can produce a long list of effects on people. These range from dizziness and irritability to emotional instability and alteration of brain wave patterns as well as other effects. Starting from these findings, Soviet scientists have developed microwave bombardment techniques which have the basic effect of greatly reducing a person's capacity for exercising judgment and fully comprehending facts at his disposal. A person under such bombardment, in other words, is very prone to make mistakes, serious mistakes. On December 15, 1976, the Liberian tanker Argo Merchant went aground on the Nantucket Shoals off Cape Cod and the resulting oil spill of 7.5 million gallons was the worst to date in American history. Many things were strange about the incident, such as the fact that the Nantucket Shoals are a very well-known navigational hazard, and the Argo Merchant was many miles off course. Hearings later revealed that the ship's navigational gear was not in proper condition, but strange behavior by the crew itself went unexplained. The Argo Merchant was then followed by a rash of tanker incidents in and near American waters, and in almost every case errors of judgment were either primary or contributing factors. It was a bad month for the Coast Guard, but it was worst of all for the 38 Nationalist Chinese crewmen of the tanker Grand Zenith, which was lost at sea off the New England coast with over 8 million gallons of heavy fuel oil aboard. On December 30, 1976, the Zenith reported its position as about 60 miles south of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. It was never heard from again. Several days later, after the ship failed to arrive at its destination, the Coast Guard began a search for the missing ship. However, it was noticed that the last position reported by the Zenith was so far north of its planned course that it did not seem to make sense. As a result, the search was shifted to a seemingly more likely area far to the south of that location. The story of the Grand Zenith is a tragic one, my friends, but it might have been less tragic had the Coast Guard taken the last position report by the Captain of the Grand Zenith more seriously, and anchored search operations on that position, because on January 7, 1977, I received intelligence information to the effect that the location of the sunken Grand Zenith was approximately 43 degrees 5 minutes north, 67 degrees 52 minutes west. Furthermore, my information indicated that as of that time there were still survivors in the immediate vicinity of the sinking. It was urgent that this be brought to the attention of the Coast Guard without delay. The search had already been narrowed down to the wrong area, over 200 miles to the southeast of the correct position, based on the finding of two life jackets bearing the name Grand Zenith. I immediately contacted the J.F. Moran Company in Providence, Rhode Island, the ship's agent in New England, and gave them the information. They passed it on to the Coast Guard, 
but there it stopped. For days I tried directly and indirectly to get someone to check out the location I had been given. On January 10 I contacted the Coast Guard directly to see what had been done. I was informed that no attempt whatever had been made to check out my report, and that no attempt was going to be made. Instead, the same fruitless area 300 miles east of Cape Cod was searched day after day for a week with no hope whatsoever of finding the survivors. Meanwhile, I could not persuade the Coast Guard even to make a single flight over the actual site of the sinking in order to check out my report. The same information was also given to the Navy after the Coast Guard refused to investigate, and the Navy too refused to check it out. Had either the Navy or the Coast Guard checked the information I gave them about the Grand Zenith, they would have found it to be true, and that would have demonstrated to the public at large that my intelligence sources about matters like this are extremely accurate. My intelligence sources had hoped that this would be exactly the outcome of my relaying the life-saving information about the Grand Zenith. But, my friends, the truth has many enemies. Topic No. 3. The Brain Scrambling Microwave Weapons, which are now entering operational status in the Soviet arsenal, are just one example of a whole new generation of super weapons which are now under development in a secret arms race. The participants in this race are none other than the corporate socialist Rockefeller cartel on the one hand and the State Socialists of the Soviet Union on the other. Thus, while they are allies in the drive to take over the rest of the world, there remains a tension of rivalry between the two. Each would like to achieve clear supremacy over the other, and each is trying to prevent the other from achieving such supremacy. Caught in the middle, as both pawn and prize, is the United States of America with her people, her resources, and her industrial and military establishment. We continually hear about the military relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States, but the real armed struggle is between the Soviet Union and the Rockefeller Empire, and it is a well-kept secret. Weapons which are under normal official Defense Department control in this country are always compared with weapons which enjoy a similar officially acknowledged status in the Soviet Union. Thus military planners think in terms of Soviet backfire bombers versus the American V-1 bomber, Soviet missiles and missile firing submarines versus their counterparts, and new developments such as cruise missiles which, by the way, are not actually a basic new concept at all. All of these things are real and important factors in the military equation, but there is another layer of weaponry that you have never heard about, yet which is crucial to the real power balance between the Rockefeller and Soviet empires. This is the realm of the secret arms race and highly advanced super weapons. This realm is completely unaffected by SALT treaties or other treaties and involves a continual jockeying for pure raw power. Thus, for example, timid reports are just beginning to be made public about the possibilities that lasers might be used to blind military satellites, and that someday far in the future they might even be developed into death rays like those of science fiction. As for operational weapons in the super-secret category, the Soviet underwater nuclear missiles that now infest our waters, and the sonar-absorbing mini-submarines which are used to plant them are good examples. 
One of the puzzling things to me until recently was the incredible Red Friday Agreement of October 1, 1976, whereby the Rockefeller brothers pledged through President Ford not to harass the Soviet submarines planting missiles in our waters. Even more puzzling has been the absence of a Soviet ultimatum or surprise attack so far, given our heavy coastal targeting with these missiles. But now I can give you the answers. When I first revealed the locations of Soviet underwater missiles around the world in monthly audio letter number 15 last August, I did so with the knowledge that a planned worldwide Soviet surprise attack was imminent, and that public exposure was the only thing that could prevent it. Now I know more fully why the surprise element was so crucial to the double cross embarked upon by the Soviet Union. The Soviets were trying to prepare and launch the attack before an awesome weapons system that is under direct Rockefeller control could be activated. But ever since that surprise was ruined, they have been forced to bide their time while they watch for another opportunity to catch the Rockefeller empire in a vulnerable moment. Meanwhile, a standoff is being maintained between the Soviet underwater missiles and the Rockefeller super weapons system I am about to tell you about. At the same time, Rockefeller propaganda is being used to rapidly wash away the idea of East-West detente in a flood of warnings about the Soviet threat and possible war. The purpose of it all is to lead up to a declaration of national emergency, as I have already warned. Finally, Nuclear War One is programmed to come. The purpose of the Rockefeller superweapons is not to prevent this war. These superweapons are only a club over the head of the Soviets to ensure that the war goes according to plan. This includes Soviet adherence to the nuclear safe zone, which was established by secret agreement to protect the Rockefeller brothers and their intimates. I was first alerted to the existence of the Rockefeller Super Weapon System as a result of my press release which was sent out to nearly 11,000 newspapers in the United States late in October in connection with the release of monthly audio letter number 17. The press release called attention to the pivotal role General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had played in preventing a surprise attack by means of Soviet underwater missiles. On November 17, 1976, one of my associates received a call from a Mr. Tony Hodges, a prominent environmentalist who lives in Honolulu. Mr. Hodges had been given a copy of the press release and called to find out more about it. He had good reason to be interested, because nearly a year earlier, unbeknownst to my associates or myself, he had delivered a 47-page warning document to the ambassadors of more than 50 countries who had signed the 1971 Seabed's Arms Control Treaty. In this warning document, Mr. Hodges alerted the reader to, quote, probable violations by the USA and the USSR of the 1971 Seabed's Arms Control Treaty, unquote. He was careful to make clear that the material contained in the document did not prove his suspicions that undersea weapons of the sort banned by the treaty had been deployed by either the United States or the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, he did explain in considerable detail why such weapons, such as missiles in undersea silos, would be militarily desirable. And he also presented the statements of several extremely highly qualified experts in this field of technology, contending that such undersea missile systems are feasible. One of these authorities is Dr. John P. Craven, who is presently the Dean of Marine Programs for the University of Hawaii, as well as Marine Affairs Coordinator for the State of Hawaii. 
Formerly, he was chief scientist on United States Navy projects which involved both the development of this nation's submarine-launched ballistic missile system and deep submersibles. He is also an attorney specializing in marine law, and a last report continued to be a high-level consultant to the Department of Defense. In his warning document, Mr. Hodges lists the impressive credentials of Dr. Craven in more detail and also presents voluminous notes on a conversation he had with Dr. Craven in November 1975 about the subject of undersea missiles. The entire Craven interview, as reported in the Hodges warning document, provides a great deal of insight into the whole subject of undersea missiles, which are discussed throughout as being sealed inside a protective capsule while they dwell in their hiding places beneath the sea. At no point did Dr. Craven admit to knowing of the actual existence of any such system. But according to the report of Mr. Hodges, the feasibility of such undersea missiles was strongly confirmed by Dr. Craven. To illustrate this, I will now quote from page 26 of the Hodges warning document, notes C-29 through C-31, quote, Craven said he could develop a total weapon system to do what I suggested in a maximum of four years, longer if it needed to be clandestine. The above is an enormously important statement by Craven since the author believes that Craven was intimately involved in the development of the systems noted in this warning document. The figure Craven gave for carrying out the system development in total secrecy, such as has been done, was seven years. This is significant because it is believed that the program to place nuclear weapons on and within the seabed was begun in 1968 while Craven was still chief scientist of the Navy's Strategic Systems Project and its Deep Submerged Systems Project. The seabed silos and the tidal wave and earthquake generating systems would certainly fall in those two areas of responsibility of his. It should be noted that whenever during the conversation we got away from whether or not the weapons system had actually been implanted, Craven quickly warmed up to the subject as the can-do technologist he is known to be. When he said he could develop such a program, a total weapons system he called it, in only four years, he did so with considerable gusto. It was in this vein that Craven offered the next remark. Craven said that the individual missile capsules did not have to be placed in silos on the seabed, but could be dumped off the rear of a fast-moving destroyer. Craven said that there would be some problem for the missile to know its precise location, but that this could be worked out." Unquote. The Hodges warning document also reports the assessment of feasibility of underwater missiles by two other experts one who is identified as having worked for 16 years on American submarine-launched ballistic missile projects is Robert C. Aldridge. He is quoted as saying, quote, quite feasible, though I was skeptical at first, unquote. Another person quoted is Costa Tsefis of MIT Center for International Studies, a well-known analyst of strategic missile systems. His assessment of the feasibility of undersea missile systems, as described by Hodges, is reported to be, quote, absolutely possible, unquote. Tsefis said that such silos could be placed on the continental shelf in water as shallow as 100 meters and still achieve the same protective purpose, end of quote from the Hodges warning document. My friends, Tony Hodges deserves a great deal of credit, both for the importance of the material he uncovered and summarized in his warning document, and for the way in which he has handled it. First, 
he tried unsuccessfully to get the government to take proper corrective measures without having to resort to embarrassing publicity about it. Then he turned to the press in the person of a syndicated columnist, whom I will simply call Mr. X. Mr. X took great interest in the Hodges warning document material and in the plan to have it delivered to the governments of the signatories to the Seabed Arms Control Treaty on December 17, 1975. According to Hodges, a big news story was written, ready to break on the same day the documents were delivered, December 17, 1975. But suddenly, Mr. X decided to kill the story because CIA Director William Colby, National Security Council Staff Director Brent Scowcroft, and Richard Cheney of the White House staff all asked him to kill it. Nevertheless, the warning document was delivered to the ambassadors of the Seabed Treaty signatories in Washington and at the United Nations in New York City. According to Mr. Hodges, this too apparently fell on deaf ears. Nor have attempts to bring it to the attention of the United States Congress apparently been of any use. But, my friends, Tony Hodges was on to something very big indeed. Having been alerted for the first time by his warning document that the United States might be involved in some way with undersea missiles or other nuclear weapons, I began checking my own intelligence sources to find out whether it was actually so or not. And my friends, the answer is yes. The Hodges warning document provides a great deal of very informative background material for what I am about to tell you. And I am informed that as long as he has copies of it left, you can obtain a copy for $10 by writing to him directly. The name and address, Mr. Anthony Hodges, H-O-D-G-E-S, 3238 Patty Drive, P-A-T-Y, Drive, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96822. His telephone number now is area code 808-988. What I have to tell you now, my friends, is not the responsibility of Tony Hodges in any way. It is what I have learned from my own intelligence sources over the past two months, and I accept full responsibility for making it public. When I revealed the presence of Soviet short-range nuclear missiles in our waters last August, I mentioned that the United States had not placed similar missiles in the waters around the Soviet Union. I can confirm once again that this is the case. But now, I have learned that an entirely different kind of underwater launch offensive nuclear missiles are targeted on the Soviet Union from resting places deep in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. According to my own intelligence information, only 14 of these undersea super missiles have been deployed, five in the Pacific, nine in the Atlantic, but that's enough. Each of these encapsulated super missiles is more akin to the Saturn moon rocket than to any ordinary ICBM. Each carries several dozen independently targetable hydrogen warheads. Several of these on each missile are super yield warheads, with the rest being similar to the normal Minuteman or Polaris warhead. The super yield warheads are designed to devastate all the major ports and key portions of the industrial heartland of the Soviet Union in spite of the civil defense measures that the Soviets have taken in recent years. The huge number of lower yield warheads are targeted on relatively soft targets throughout the Soviet Union with the sole purpose of raising the Soviet casualty toll as high as possible. The whole purpose of these undersea super missiles is to confront the Soviet Union with a threat of massive counterattack which cannot be neutralized in a Soviet first strike, and which would ruin the Soviet Union as a functioning society. According to plan, 
These missiles would virtually destroy the Soviet Union as a modern civilization, killing over 100 million people in the process. But, my friends, the purpose of these undersea super missiles aimed at the Soviet Union is not to protect you and me, nor to prevent war. They are under the direct control of the Rockefeller Brothers by way of their controlled CIA, not the normal chain of command through the Department of Defense. And their purpose is to serve as an awesome club over the heads of the Soviet rulers to make sure that nuclear war one goes as planned. The worldwide Pearl Harbor attack that was imminent last August when I publicly revealed the worldwide locations of Soviet underwater missiles was a daring Soviet gamble. Its purpose was to eliminate the four Rockefeller brothers from the scene and simultaneously prevent the CIA undersea missiles from being launched by making such counterattacks seem pointless. But the key ingredient of that plan was secrecy and total surprise. My intelligence sources made it abundantly clear last July and August that the only way to prevent immediate nuclear disaster was public exposure of the truth. And now we know why. Now we also know why the four Rockefeller brothers felt that they could get away with the seemingly suicidal policy instituted on Red Friday, October 1, 1976, agreeing to allow the Soviet Union to keep planting short-range nuclear missiles in our territorial waters without harassment. It's all part of a nuclear standoff involving weapons the public does not even know about and in which the Rockefellers believe they hold the upper hand. There are now strong indications that the four Rockefeller brothers, believing they still hold the upper hand with their undersea super missiles, plan to turn the presence of the Soviet missiles in our waters to their own advantage. During the fall of 1976, they reestablished the strained alliance between themselves and the Soviet Union for the time being. And now we are being built up rapidly to accept a declaration of national emergency. The announcement by the government that there are Soviet missiles in our waters is now being arranged to be done with the advanced knowledge of the Soviet Union. Just as Franklin D. Roosevelt declared an unlimited national emergency on May 27, 1941, as part of the build-up for war, a similar scenario is being worked out now to trap us all. But the cruel joke may be on the Rockefeller brothers themselves, who may yet be buried by the Soviet Union along with millions of us. Something is going wrong with the CIA super missiles deep in the ocean, and as of now, one is completely disabled and five more are deteriorating rapidly and probably are not usable. That leaves only eight undersea super missiles at the disposal of the Rockefeller brothers, and their reliability, too, is now open to serious question. In addition, the Soviet fears about their corroding underwater missiles in the secret Soviet missile crisis of 1971 which I described in monthly audio letter number 14 last July, apply again now. Several of the undersea super missiles are now leaking plutonium from their disabled warheads into the surrounding water. And the possibility of an uncontrolled explosion cannot be ruled out. Should this happen, Tidal waves or earthquakes could be created that could affect Hawaii, the Bahamas, or any place along the east coast from Nova Scotia to Florida. Just as my intelligence sources emphasized last summer that public exposure of the truth was the key to avoiding disaster, the same situation exists again now. 
the CIA undersea super missiles in the Atlantic and Pacific cannot protect us from war, and in fact are not even intended for that purpose, yet they sit there as a present hazard to all of our lives, directly and indirectly. Therefore, I am going to reveal the locations of all 14 of the CIA undersea super missiles in navigational coordinates. At a minimum, I hope to strip the Rockefeller cartel of their ace in the hole that makes our survival irrelevant to them. But even more, I hope to undo their continued cooperation with the Soviet Union in a plan to sacrifice millions of our lives. This may well be our last chance to prevent the present pre-war period from erupting as planned into nuclear war one. The missiles are located in water depths ranging from a few hundred feet at several uh, Atlantic sites to more than 15,000 feet at one Pacific site. The following five locations are in the Pacific Ocean. Incidentally, these are in the vicinity of locations which are shown on a map in the Hodges Warning Document as probable locations of undersea weapons. As explained in the Warning Document, Mr. Hodges believes that these locations were the subject of seabed weapons installations or tests by the CIA-financed Howard Hughes mystery ship, the Glomar Explorer. Pacific Missile 1, about 25 miles north of the Hawaiian Island Kway at 22-37-14 north, 159-21-55 west. Plutonium leakage from this missile is badly contaminating the surrounding water. Pacific Missile 2, about 10 miles north of Kway at 22-21-59 north, 159-36-19 west. Leaking, but not as badly. Pacific Missile 3, about 650 miles northwest of Christmas Island at 9-20-0 north, 165-18-41 west. Pacific Missile 4, about 550 miles northwest of Christmas Island at 8-0-0 north, 163-34-38 west. This missile is totally disabled. Pacific Missile 5, about 420 miles west northwest of Christmas Island at 3-2-0 north, 164-35-25 west. Now for the Atlantic Missiles. Atlantic Missile 1 in Canadian waters near Sable Island at 43-52-0 north, 59-10-54 west. Atlantic Missile 2 in Canadian waters about 140 miles south-southeast of Halifax, Nova Scotia at 42 30, 24 north, 63, 1, 5 west. Atlantic Missile 3, about 225 miles due east of Cape Cod at 41, 46, 23 north, 65, 54, 33 west. Atlantic Missile 4, about 120 miles southeast of Cape Cod at 40, 20, 0 north, 68, 18, 32 west. Leaking. Atlantic Missile 5, about 50 miles to the southwest of Atlantic Missile 4 at 40, 4, 0 north, 69, 17, 27 west. Atlantic Missile 6, only about 30 miles southeast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina at 34, 49, 1 north, 75, 17, 27 west, leaking. Atlantic Missile 7, about 240 miles east-northeast of Charleston, South Carolina at 33, 5, 40 north, 75, 43, 38 west. Atlantic Missile 8, about 290 miles east-southeast of Jacksonville, Florida, at 30, 9, 9 north, 77, 8, 44 west, leaking. And finally, Atlantic Missile 9 in British waters, about 100 miles east-northeast of Nassau in the Bahamas, at 25, 19, 21 north, 75, 54, 33 west. In 1947, 
The Rockefeller brothers arranged for the CIA to be created for their own private purposes. And today, it is the CIA, not the normal military chain of command, that exercises control for the Rockefellers over the undersea super missiles as part of its expanding encroachment into military affairs. This is helping to bring our beloved country to agony and ruin, unless, my friends, we stop it. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.